Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to show you how you can build this electronic decanting puzzle suitable for use in an escape room game. Now, you might have seen a version of this puzzle used in the film Die Hard 3, where Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson need to measure out a quantity of water in order to defuse a bomb. Now, we're not going to be using liquids in this version, but otherwise the puzzle's the same. So, players come across three containers that can hold different quantities of some sort of material, and I'm representing that using these three LED strips here. So, this one has a total capacity of eight, and it's currently full, and then we've got two smaller containers. This one can hold five, but it's empty, and this one can hold three, and it's also empty. And players also come across this filling loop here, and this has got labels on the end. So this end says from, and the other end says to. And what players are going to do is they're going to connect this filling loop between the different containers, and when they do that, this transfer button at the bottom lights up. If I now press that, it's going to transfer the material from this container to this one, either until the destination container is full or until the source container is empty. Now, if I press that button again now, nothing more is going to happen because this container here is now full. What I'll need to do is to pull the loop out and plug it back in the other way around. And now I can transfer the liquid back and I'm back to where I started from. And what players need to do in this puzzle is to measure out some target value. So the example I'm using in this case is four, and I've set that in code, but I'll show you how to change that to any value you want later, so long as it's possible to attain using the particular set of containers you've got. Uh, so I'm now going to try to do the transfers necessary to uh, get the value four in one of these containers. Uh, so I'm going to move from that one to that one, and then I'm going to move from that one back into this one again, uh, and then I'm going to move from that one to that one, and then from this one to this one. Concentrate, Alistair. Always a problem with live demonstrations. Okay, so what I've got now is I've got uh, the container here has got one unit in it. This one has got five and it's full. Uh, this one has a capacity of three, but it's only got two in it. So when I now transfer from the middle container, which has got five in it, it's only gonna fit one unit into the one at the end here. That will leave four behind, which is the target value I'm aiming to get. That's going to solve the puzzle. And when that happens, the Arduino is going to trigger the relay here to energize the mag lock, and that's going to release this catch stuck in the end. At least I hope that's going to happen. So uh, let's see if I've done it right. So when I press the transfer button, there we go, and the puzzle is solved. So now you've seen the puzzle in action, let me show you a little bit more about how it's constructed. And we'll start off by looking at the hardware components on the board here. So everything required to run this puzzle, you can see in front of you here. There's nothing on the reverse here other than just a bit of wiring, uh, which I tried to get out of the way to kind of make it a bit neater. And the whole thing is being powered by this Arduino Uno here. Um, it's got two shields stacked on top of it. I've got a screw shield and then I've got a proto shield. They don't really add any functionality at all. Um, they're just for convenience to make it a little bit easier to plug the other components in. Um, the proto shield on the top particularly has got uh, two buttons on it. Um, one of them is a, a reset button which allows me to reset the puzzle back to its initial state and the other one is actually a solve button. So um, if I'd not been able to uh, conduct the correct series of transfers earlier, I could have pressed the solve button and it would actually automatically run through the series of transfers necessary and in a minute it will eject the catch again for me. Um, and then over this side, so this is really the components that the players actually encounter in the escape room itself. So the containers, I'm using these WS 2812B LED strips. 
Um, these are very common, very cheap. I've used them a lot in previous projects and they are programmable LED strips. So with a few lines of code on the Arduino, we can change which set of LEDs to light up. You can change colors if you want to as well. So you could theme this bit differently. Um, and they are great, really, really great components. Um, I said this was a decanting puzzle. Um, we're obviously not using any real liquids here. And generally speaking, you wouldn't want to in an escape room because they're messy and tricky to reset and, and things like that. Um, but so I'm kind of simulating uh, pouring liquid between containers here. But you could uh, theme this in many different ways. So for example, if you put these LED strips um, inside uh, beakers or test tubes or something like that, you could have this being some kind of alchemical experiment where you had to mix uh, different liquids together. Or if this was a, a science fiction setting, these could represent the different amounts of fuel in three different reactor cores or something like that. So we're not really transferring liquid or decanting anything, but you can kind of, um, you know, you can you can dress that up to the player to make it appear like you are. Uh, obviously, got an arcade button at the here at the bottom here, which has got an LED behind it. That's going to be illuminated when a, a transfer is possible. Um, and then over this side of the board, so this is kind of the behind the scenes side. I've already mentioned the Arduino itself. When the puzzle is solved, uh, that's going to energize this relay. I'm using a solid state relay in this example. Um, no particular reason. You could use one of the, the small blue relay modules that are a bit more common and, and click when they're energized. Um, I'm using a solid state relay, but it has the same effect. Um, the Arduino will cause that to energize. That will supply the 12 volt power here to the mag lock, uh, which then releases the catch. So all of that's um, fairly standard stuff. Uh, the socket connectors themselves at the bottom, these are uh, 6.4 millimeter audio jacks. So like you plug a headphone into in audio material. The most interesting component and the kind of the key method by which this puzzle actually works is actually this rather harmless looking cable here. Um, so this is an audio cable. It plugs between those audio sockets there, but it's been a little bit modified. And if I unscrew the ends, I'll show you what I've done to it. So on the from end here, hopefully my camera will uh, allow me to demonstrate this to you. So on the from end here, this is just a mono cable. So you see we've got a, uh, a single white wire there plugged into the uh, end of the headphone connector there. If we take a look at the other end there, you'll see it's slightly different. I hope you can see this. Um, so in line here in the wire, before it connects the headphone socket, we're passing through this small component, and this is a diode. Now a diode is a uh, very common, it's a basic electronic component, so like a resistor or a capacitor or something like that. Um, and the key feature of a diode is that it only allows current to pass through it in one direction from the anode to the cathode. Um, now, if you've used LEDs in your project before, an LED is a light emitting diode. So that's a special type of diode that emits light. And you'll know that you have to plug an LED in the right way round. If you plug it in backwards, it won't do anything. Um, and that's just like this diode as well. This will only allow current to pass through in one direction. And the point about that is, that is what's going to let us know which way the cable has been inserted. So if I plug the from end in here and the to end in here, the fact that the, the diode is inserted in this cable here means that the Arduino can detect not just that two pins have been connected here, but also the direction in which that cable has been plugged in. That's what allows us to make the transfers um, that kind of are the key to how this puzzle works. And if I plug it back in again, the other way around, we can transfer in the other direction. And here's a fritzing project showing how the components are connected together. I've tried to lay them out in the same relative position as they were on the board just now and just so you can see how they correspond but also show you in a bit more detail uh, how the components are actually wired together. So in some Arduino projects you have to use particular 
GPIO pins for particular purposes. So let's say you had a sensor that used an SPI connection, for example. Well, that would mean you'd have to wire it to pins 13, 12 and 11, let's say, because those are the pins that are reserved for the SPI interface. Or if you had an I2C connection, you have to use pins A4 and A5. But in this particular project, all the components here you can really uh, connect to any of the available GPIO pins on the Arduino. Um, they don't have any special requirements at all, um, which means that this is quite versatile. You can use many different styles of Arduino here, or you could use a, a Wemos a Mini or an ESP as well. Um, it's, it's quite possible to change this in, in different ways. So the pins I've used, I've chosen them purely because they were located on the correct side of the board to make the wiring a little bit more straightforward, that's all. Um, so starting off on, on the left hand side, so if we take a look at the inputs to start with, um, so here we have our cable which has got the diode in the middle of it. Um, so as I mentioned current can only flow through this direction from the anode to the cathode which is the side marked with this uh, stripe here. Um, I'm using a 1N4007 diode, but really you can use pretty much any diode here at all. It doesn't have to have any special properties whatsoever. Um, and that is going to connect uh, two of the uh, jack sockets on this side, so my audio connectors. And each of those is wired to the analog pins A3, A4 and A5. Now even though these are uh, denoted as analogue pins, we're actually not using that property of them at all, we're just using them as digital input and outputs here. So again, like I say, you can really use any pins you want for those. Um, and then lower down here we've got, so this is my momentary button which we're going to press when we actually want to make a transfer. That is wired through this brown wire here to pin A1 and to ground and we'll use the internal pull-up resistor to actually detect when that's been pressed. And next to it, uh, so this LED, well this is actually positioned uh, under the button here, it's going to light up through it and that has got a current limiting resistor of 220 ohms on the signal line that is connected to pin A2 here and that's also connected to ground as well. And then up the top here we have our LED strips which are going to represent our containers and the, um, the amount of substance that they're currently holding. So you might have noticed in the video that I've got these wired in this kind of S shape wiring. Um, so this is actually all a, a single continuous strip even though it looks like we had three containers side by side. They're actually wired like this. Um, now when you mount this in a prop and escape room obviously you'll want to cover these wires over and just put a little bit of um, you know finishing on the top to hide them but the significance of the pattern of the way they're wired here what this means is when we come to write our code to address a particular LED in the strip the way they're numbered are going to be well this is the first LED here and then going up the the first container they're going to be one two three four five six seven eight LEDs in this strip and then the ninth LED will be the top of the middle strip and it will go 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and then we're going to be going up the, the final one again with 14, 15, 16. So it, it kind of might appear like the middle container has kind of been put upside down um, because we're going to be increasing in number, uh, the index number of the LED as we move down it. Um, this will all make sense when I show you the code later uh, we'll kind of account for that because we'll explicitly write out the order in which the LEDs appear um, but you just need to be aware of aware of how they're wired like that. Um, best practice when it comes to using these LEDs is always to place a series resistor um, in the data line sort of just before the first LED as well. So here you can see we've got a, a blue wire which is connected to pin A0 and you want a resistor somewhere between about 300 and 500 ohms. I'm using a 330 ohm resistor here, that's a standard resistor value um, and you just want to be putting that in line before the first data in uh, to the first LED here. 
I've also got a capacitor and the capacitor is going between the ground and the 5 volt lines. You can see the negative side of the capacitor, that's the one with the strip on it here. That's going to ground and the other side is going to 5 volt here. So when these LEDs um, turn on, particularly if they're at full brightness, they can actually draw a surprising amount of current and rather than kind of suddenly have that demand for, for current be kind of a um, an inrush of current demand from the Arduino here. That's why we want a capacitor placed nearby so that it can just provide that, um, you know, for that sudden fluctuation in current requirements when the LEDs first turn on. Um, so this is a thousand microfarad capacitor. Now I've got to be careful when I say that because I'm aware that I've got this wrong in the past. The problem with capacitors is because they're they're measured using quite small fractional values. So you measure capacitors in, in picofarads and nanofarads and, and microfarads and millifarads and it's, it's easy to get muddled up. So this is a thousand microfarads which is denoted with this uh, mu symbol here. Uh, which is the same as one millifarad as well, um, which you might see it uh, expressed as. And it needs to be rated for sufficient voltage as well. So we're, we've got a 5 volt supply here. So I'm actually using a 6.3 volt capacitor, um, which is a standard capacitor value, like I said. But it's, it's greater than 5 volts, which is what's important in this case. Um, and just like the diodes, you know, these are cheap components that are easy to get. I very strongly recommend you buy a a mixed bag of uh, capacitors and probably diodes as well and resistors for that matter. You will only need to spend a few pounds you know acquiring a, a whole load of those kind of components and you'll find they come in very very useful in in many different projects. Um, so yeah getting getting mixed bags of, of basic electronic components that that is definitely worthwhile I'd say. Um, and that's it for the, the left hand side of the board really. Um, and then we look over the right hand side. So uh, here we've got our solve button. Um, so this was actually mounted on the proto board in the video I showed. Um, and that is connected between pins 11 and ground. And just like the transfer button we'll also use the internal pull up resistor to detect when that's been pressed. And then up here we've got our relay module. Um, so I mentioned I'm using a solid state relay rather than a more conventional relay module. Um, there's no real reason why, it was just that this was what was at the top of my relay parts box when I rummaged through it to assemble this project. Um, so a, a normal relay is an electromechanical component, so you supply a voltage on one side of it and that uh, energizes a magnetic coil which causes a, a metal latch to flip across and form a circuit on the other side. Um, a solid state relay, well it, it has the same effect but it's purely electronic. It has no moving parts, no mechanical parts at all. Um, but it's the same idea in terms of operation. So we supply a small current, low voltage on this side, which is the input side as you can see. And we've got the positive side of the input side connected to pin 12 and the negative side here is going to ground. And when we write a high signal to that input pin here, what it will do is it will allow a much higher voltage, higher current to flow on the load side of the relay. So you can see this relay is, is rated for up to 200 volts DC. In fact we're only going to use 12 volt DC supply and that's going to uh, come into the positive terminal here, out the negative terminal, and when the relay is energized that means that this will form a closed circuit on this side which will allow 12 volts DC to supply uh, to flow into the maglock and that will eject the catch. Now I'm using a fail secure maglock um, so this is a style that when it is not powered it is remaining locked and to unlock it you supply it with just a, a brief pulse power about a quarter of a second um, 12 volt power that will cause it to eject the catch and after that time you can cut the power again and in fact you need to cut the power again because if you continuously supply power after it's been ejected you will damage the uh, solenoid inside so we'll use the the Arduino when the puzzle has been solved we will use it to control the relay 
just to activate this side for a short amount of time until the maglock has been released and then we will cut power again um, once the catch has been ejected. Um, and that's it. And here's the Arduino code. Um, for any of you that have followed my previous video tutorials, the structure of this may start to look um, fairly familiar to you by now. Um, so I always begin my code with a section of includes. So these are external libraries which I want to incorporate into my project. Um, and I'm using two, I'm using the bounce two library. Um, this is for when you have a button input, for example, um, you know, it's sort of possible to sometimes accidentally register a double press when you kind of release the button um, and you can get some sort of noise when you press or release the button. Well, this library will help you what's called debounce that button input and that makes sure you get a, a nice clean on or off signal from a, a mechanical button. And I'm also using the fast LED library. Uh, this is a great library for controlling all sorts of programmable LEDs. So the WS2812B strips we're using and also other sorts of LEDs as well. Um, it provides lots of functions to make working with those easier. Um, and then we get onto the constants. So the constants are values that are not going to change throughout the duration of the uh, project. So first of all we define the number of jugs and also the capacities that each of those jugs is going to have. Now I'm using three. Um, uh, there are variations of this puzzle that actually only use two jugs. Um, but when that's the case, there's normally some kind of reservoir that you can fill them from. And that's kind of the role that the first jug, which I'm using, is taking. So my first jug, I've put a note here, to make sure that that is sufficient capacity to be able to fill both of the other jugs from it. And if that's the case, then that can't really have any effect on the puzzle solving itself because it will always be able to receive all of the water from the other two jugs and also it will always be able to fill both of the other jugs from it. So it will never play a role in actually dividing the, um, the volume of liquid in either of the other two jugs because it will always be capable of um, receiving or um, giving an infinite amount of liquid. So effectively you can consider the first jug in this setup to be of infinite size actually. It won't make any difference so long as it is at least as large as the other two jugs combined. In terms of the values of the the other two jugs themselves, well you can choose what values you want in a sense but depending on what values you choose you may not be able to reach every um, target value um, and that's explained in the the note here in fact. Um, so basically if the greatest common divisor of the two remaining jugs, that's kind of a mathematical term so don't worry too much if you don't understand it, um, the, any target value is reachable if it is a multiple of whatever the greatest common divisor is. Now five and three are relatively prime to each other. They don't share any factors in common. So with that particular setup we'll actually be able to reach any target value within subject to the, the overall capacity of the jugs. But if we were to choose let's say 4 and 2 instead, well those share a common factor. They share a common factor of 2. So that means that not every target value is going to be possible. Um, now like I say that's that's slightly mathematically based so if you don't understand that don't worry too much about it. If you use the values I have chosen here um, I can tell you that you will be able to uh, attain the target value for and in fact you'll be able to attain many other values as well. I've included a bit of code later on that will actually test whether the target value you have chosen is possible given the capacity of containers you've chosen as well. Um, so I'll, I'll show that in a bit more detail later on. Um, the next section this is very simply where we define what the pins are that we have uh, attached each of the components to. Like I said these can really be any GPIO pins you want. Um, I've just chosen these ones because they were conveniently positioned. And in this section here this is where uh, I mentioned the fact that the LEDs are mapped in this particular uh, sort of S-shaped route. So I've created an array here at the bottom 
um, that lists in order the index of the LEDs as they are measured from the bottom up kind of thing. Um, so uh, um, this this translates that shape there into an index that we're going to be able to count into. That's what that means. Uh, then we get onto the global section here. So uh, globals are variables that are going to be shared between several functions in the um, in the code below. Uh, we'll define the transfer button and the solve button. Um, we'll just declare these as bounce to button objects to start with. So we haven't yet attached them to pins. We'll do that in the setup function in a moment. But we'll say that we want to attach this bounce to button and that's going to enable us to take this clean reading from these uh, from these mechanical buttons and it, for it to have been debounced for us. Uh, we'll define an array of LEDs. Uh, this array needs to have sufficient length for all the capacities of all the jugs combined. Um, so in this case I've got an 8, a 5 and a 3 so that's 16 LEDs in total. And we also uh, define the starting values for each of the containers. So up here in the constant section we define the capacities that each of the uh, containers are going to have and like I say that is constant because that's not going to change throughout the puzzle. However in the global section the actual value they've got in them right now well that is going to change so that's not a constant that's just a, a regular integer array there. Um, so that's all our kind of variables set up and then we get into the functions of how we're going to use them. So the first function we get to here, so this is a, a helper function if you want and I mentioned this um, before, we're going to calculate the greatest common divisor of two supplied values, int a and int b. Um, and the way that we're going to do that is something called the recursive Euclidean algorithm. You can look this up in uh, Wikipedia if you want, um, or you can just take my word for it that this works. <laughs> um, it uses a modulo division here of two values and it also calls itself. But what it's going to do is it's going to give us the, uh, let's say, the greatest common divisor that two containers have in common. And that in turn is going to let us know whether a target value is possible to achieve or not. Uh, given the selection of jugs that you have chosen. Um, so we'll we'll include that in the code later on. Um, the transfer function here, this is um, going to transfer as much liquid as possible between the from, so the index of the container you want to transfer from and the index of the container you want to transfer to. Um, it's going to throw some output to the serial connection. I didn't actually show this in the example earlier, um, but for debugging purposes and when you're developing this, I do actually write out to the serial monitor window in Arduino, um, you know, at the state of the puzzle at every stage and every action that occurs, which can really help you um, to understand what's going on as you're stepping through the puzzle. Um, uh, we need to calculate how much liquid is going to be transferred between the chosen containers as well. Um, so what we need to do is we can only transfer up to either as much as the destination container can receive or as much as the source container has got in it. Um, so the amount that the destination container can receive is the difference between its total capacity and how much it's already got in it at the moment. So that's the capacity of the two jug minus the current value in the two jug. And the amount that the uh, the container we're pouring from has got in it, well that's given by the current values of from. And then we want to work out the minimum of those two values. So which is the lower down value? It's either how much we've got or it's how much is capable of being accepted into the jug we're pouring into. Whichever one is the minimum, well that's how much we're going to transfer. Now I've commented out the next two lines. Um, if you wanted to transfer that amount instantly, you could simply then take off the amount that's being transferred from the from jug and add it on to the to jug. 
Um, but I did that to start with and it was kind of a bit unclear to the player exactly what was going on. So I then modified that code slightly instead. Um, and what we do now is we kind of, uh, we make the LEDs change gradually. So, you know, one of them decreases and the other one steps up, which I think helps to, it helps to simulate the action of pouring, I think anyway. Um, and it just makes it a little bit clearer what's going on. So for the player's benefit, um, what we'll do is we will set up a loop and rather than just take off the amount of transfer all in one go, we will one at a time decrease the amount in the from jug and increase the value in the to jug until the total amount transferred is equal to the amount to transfer. So this section of code here and this section of code here do the same thing. The only difference is that this does it instantly, whereas this transfers it one unit at a time. And you can adjust the speed of the delay here to make that pouring animation faster or slower. So if you choose a, a lower value here, it will make it pour faster because it's delaying for less time in between adding each unit on. Um, if you set a higher value here, it's going to make it pour slower. Um, and then what we do here, so here is another just output. Like I mentioned to the serial monitor, just so you can see what's going on. We're going to loop over all the jugs and we will just create a little text buffer and into that buffer we will write a jug number something or other has currently got this many units of this many units available uh, so we'll write jug number x the current value of the amount of, of liquid stored in x as a fraction of the overall capacity of x and we'll do that for all of the jugs so that will just um, you know, provide a, a little useful serial monitor output of what's going on there. And finally, because we're still in the transfer um, function at the moment here, remember, so after each transfer, what we need to do is to test whether as a result of that action we've solved the puzzle or not. So we'll do this little test here. If is solved, and we'll provide an argument to the solved puzzle, which is the, the target value that we want to test has been solved. So in this case, the target was what we specified in the globals at the top, and we said that the target was four. So if the puzzle has been solved for the target value of four, what we're going to do is write a high signal to the relay pin, wait for a quarter of a second, and then write a low signal again and that will be sufficient just to eject the lock and uh, lock it again basically. Um, and we only need to, to test if the puzzle is, has been solved after a successful transfer because that's the only time that the state of the puzzle is actually going to have changed. Um, so the is solved method that's being called there, well that's actually defined in the next bit down, that's here. So um, this function here returns a boolean value true or false and it says uh, a parameter called target value which we provided as the target which was four so very simply all we do is loop over all the jugs again if the current value of any of the jugs because we don't mind which jug they managed to get four in so long as they were able to attain the target value of four if that's equal to the target value then we return true the puzzle has been solved and if we get all the way through this loop and none of the jugs has had the, the uh, target value, then we return false instead. So that's that function there. Um, the next function down. So this is the automatic function that is going to solve the puzzle for the specified target value. And it will solve the puzzle from whatever state the uh, the jugs currently have so however it doesn't only solve it from the beginning it will solve it from uh, any starting condition at all if a solution is possible this will solve it and um, this actually follows a, a rather clever set of rules that you can use yourself as well if you ever need to solve one of these puzzles this will give you a universal uh, set of rules you can apply that will always let you solve these types of puzzles so we'll, we'll step through them uh, one at a time the first one we do is actually check that the target value that's been specified is possible to attain. So 
if we are trying to get a target value that is greater than the amount of liquid in the largest jug, we're definitely not going to be able to do that. So if that's the case, uh, we'll say not possible and we will return out of this function. That's the first test. The second test, and this is something I've mentioned a few times now, so the target value needs to be a multiple of the greatest common divisor of the other two jugs. So this was a function we defined up at the top of the code. We will pass it the capacities of the next two jugs and we'll see whether that is a multiple uh, or the target value is a multiple of that, sorry. If it is a multiple, that means that there's no remainder. However, if it's not, uh, then we'll say we can't solve and the target amount is not a multiple. So that's our second test. If both those tests pass, however, that means that the solution is possible. And we get to the solution by repeating uh, a series of relatively simple rules. So until we reach the solution, the first thing we do is we look at the first jug. And by the first jug, I mean um, the first non-reservoir jug, in fact. So the one that has the index 1, which is actually the one in the middle. So if that is empty, which means that the current value in that jug is 0, then what we do is we're going to fill it up. So we'll transfer from 0, which is the leftmost one, to the reservoir, into the middle one. Brilliant. That's it. Our second rule is if the second jug is full, so this is the smallest, this is the three capacity jug, then we empty it back into the reservoir again. So if current values of 2 is equal to the full capacity of 2, then we transfer from 2 into 0, which is the reservoir. Okay. In any other case, what we do is we transfer from 1 to 2. And those are the three rules that we just have to do. And we apply those every single time. We take a new look at the state of the board. And we'll say, if the first jug is empty, we'll fill it up from the reservoir. If the second jug is full, we'll empty it into the reservoir. And in any other case, we'll just transfer from the middle jug to the rightmost jug. And we do that over and over again until the target value is reached. We update the display each time so the player can actually see what's going on. And again, I've introduced a slight delay here. The only reason for this to be here is so that players get a chance to see what the step was that just got made before the next one happens. If you don't put a delay here, this while loop will run around and you know the whole thing will be finished in a millisecond so you don't get to see what happened. So this is an artificial pause um, just to, to demonstrate the series of steps. And you can follow these rules yourself. Like I say, if you want to solve one of these puzzles manually, I promise you, uh, those three steps in turn will always lead you to the solution. Um, now, throughout that, we were calling this update display function. And in fact, we also called that update display function when we were in the um, transfer function up here as well. So what update display does, well, that actually um, updates the values in the LED strips. So what we do is we uh, step over all of the LEDs in all of the strips, and we also loop over each of the three jugs. And what we need to do is effectively decide whether to light up an LED or not, depending on whether the index value of the LED at that point is less than the quantity of liquid in that container. So I'm using red and black. Uh, black in fast LED terms means unlit basically but if you wanted to you could use any colors you wanted at all here so you could light up um, you could even light up the the three different containers in different colors if you want although that might be a little bit hard to explain how when you pour from one container into another the liquid changes color apparently that'd be a bit weird but you could do it um, or you could make you know rainbow colors whatever you want but what we're going to do is we're going to um, loop through each jug then we're going to loop over the capacities of each jug and then we're going to compare the LED index to the value uh, that this jug is actually filled to 
And if this LED is less than the current value in this container, we're going to color it in red. So that's like saying that this container does contain uh, at least this quantity of LEDs. Uh, otherwise, we're going to color them in black. So these are for the LEDs that are at the top half of the um, strip that are empty, that have been pulled out, things like that. And when I say top half, because we are referring to the LED mapping array here, which all the way back here somewhere, where do we have it? So this is the one that actually defines the um, the LEDs in the order that they occur from the bottom up, remember. So we've got 0 to 7. Then we've got 12 to 8 listed backwards because that's how they were in the middle strip. Um, so that's the reason why we have that array here is that we can actually do a direct comparison between the index of the LED, compare it to the current value in that jug and that's what enables us to colour them different colours. Um, I hope that makes sense. That's, that's kind of a a bit tricky to explain exactly what's going on there but what but that's essentially what we're we're doing is um, we're looking at the index position of each LED we're looking at the value in each container and then we're coloring them one of two colors and uh, all the time here what we're doing is we're updating this array called LEDs that's the array that actually contains the RGB values representing each LED to actually then send that through to the strip itself that's when we need to call the fast LED dot show function. Uh, so that will actually um, cause this uh, array here to, to be reflected in the lights that are actually um, being shown to the player. OK, so we've come all this way. We haven't even got to the setup function yet. The setup function, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, this is what's called whenever an Arduino code first fires up. So when we connect power to the device, this is what's called. Um, we will start a serial connection. Um, like I say, this is only used for debugging purposes in this particular project, but it's quite useful. Um, and so we begin with a specified board rate. And I'm also going to just print out the file name and the time and date at which this version of the code was compiled, just so we know what code we're looking at. We will uh, initialize the LEDs. So the fast LED library that we're using has this method called add LEDs. And it takes a, a few parameters here. So we say the type of LEDs we're using. I say fast LED actually supports a whole load of different common LED types, but um, this is the ones I'm using. This is the data pin that we've got them connected to via that series resistor. Uh, this is the color ordering. Um, so we're probably most familiar to thinking about RGB color ordering, uh, but as it happens, WS2812B strips actually use green, red, blue color ordering instead. If you find in your code that, um, you know, up here, if you specified that the LEDs should be red and they're actually turning out blue or green, um, it might be that you've got some LEDs with a different color byte ordering here. So you might want to try changing that for one of the other values. Um, and we also tell it what is the array that we're going to store the LED values in and how many of them are there in total on the strip as well. Uh, so those are the different parameters of the constructor here. Um, we will attach our two buttons that we're going to read. Um, so normally you might um, uh, use pin mode like this to set the button pins into input pull-up modes. But because we're using the bounce to object, we don't actually need to do that. We call this attach method instead, and that will in turn call pin mode for us. So we don't need to explicitly do that. Um, we'll attach the the debounce object using the input pull up mode uh, for the buttons. We will, however, we will specify that we want the LED pin to be an output and the relay pin to be an output and we will initially write a low signal to the relay pin to the relays off uh, that means that the mag lock is locked and we'll just call update display once so that um, you know the correct initial state of the puzzle is being displayed on the LEDs then we get into the program loop uh, so this just loops over and over and over again while the puzzle is running 
and so these are the set of actions that we need to uh, call over and over again. The first thing we do is we find out whether there have been any new inputs. So have either of the buttons been pressed? And we do that by calling the update method here. Um, if the solve button has been pressed, well in that case we can call the solve method which we defined earlier. So um, this was the solve method that solves it for the particular specified target value and that's what we're going to do if the solve button was pressed. Um, otherwise the solve button hasn't been pressed well let's see whether the filling loop has been connected instead then. So that's this section of code here. Um, what we'll do is we'll define first of all two variables just to say from jug and to jug and we'll initialize them as minus one so we're making an assumption to start with that the filling loop hasn't been connected um, so we'll give it a value of minus one just to represent that but then what we'll do is we will loop over each of the pins and we'll loop over them twice so we have a nested loop here um, because we need to check in both directions. Now remember the important bit about this puzzle is not just that the loop has been connected but actually connecting from A to B is different from connecting from B to A. So we actually need to loop over the whole thing twice to check in both directions. Um, we don't need to check whether a pin has been connected to itself however though because that's just a bit daft but we need to connect it to every other possible pin. So we'll call this isConnected method has um, the filling pin that is uh, index i being connected to the filling pin that is index j. If so what we'll do is we'll assign the from jug and to jug values to j and i respectively. So that means they no longer have the values of minus 1 that they did up here. They've now got a value that's somewhere between 0 and 3 which is going to represent the, uh, the pins that they actually had instead. But we'll check over twice because we're going to check in both directions because connecting i to j is different from j to i. Um, if we get to this point here and from and to have both been assigned values that aren't minus one that means that we have been able to work out the um, the correct filling pins that they've been assigned to and what that means is that we can allow the player to make a transfer um, so long as uh, there is something in the jug that we want to transfer from and so long as the uh, destination jug has got some capacity in it, that means a transfer is possible. So we'll light up the, uh, the LED to say that a transfer is possible. And if all these things are true, so if the wire has been connected and there is something in the from jug and there's some capacity in the to jug, and if the transfer button is pressed, that's when we can actually um, do the transfer here and update the display. Uh, this else here goes with this up, uh, this if up here. So this is when the loop has been connected, but it's been connected between two jugs that uh, you can't pour any liquid from and to, either because there's no capacity or that there's none in the jug in the first place. And this else here goes with this if, um, because that's to suggest that the loop hasn't even been connected and in either of those cases well we're not going to light up the LED pin and also we're not going to test even whether the transfer button has been pressed there's no point testing because we know that it's not possible to uh, make a transfer in those cases uh, and then we we call fast LED show on every iteration through loop just to make sure that we are always showing the latest value of the LEDs. Um, and finally um, this is the is connected method so this is actually what's being called um, from the middle of this test here so this is where we loop over each set of pins and we loop them over twice to test in both directions and this is actually a function which I wrote for a previous project um, this is what I used in my connect the wires um, puzzle a few years back um, so it's a very simple test it tests whether two 
Arduino pins are connected to each other and the way it does it is it sets uh, one of the pins as an output and it sets the other one as an input pull up so at that point the input pull up is going to be reading a high value uh, because it's been pulled up internally through a resistor to 5 volts um, and what we'll do then is we will write a low signal to the output pin and then we'll take a reading of the input pin. Now if the uh, two pins are connected at this point what will happen is that this low signal here will effectively kind of overwrite or overrule the input pull up and it will pull the input pin down to zero because that's the low signal here. So if we take a digital reading of the input pin and it's zero, we know it must be connected to the output pin that's writing a low signal. If we take a digital read of the input pin and it's high, well that suggests that it's not connected to the output pin because the reason we're getting a high reading is because we are still connected to the input pull up up here. So, um, we can tell whether they're connected or not by taking the inverse of the digital reading. When the digital reading is high, that means they're not connected. And when the digital reading is low, that means they are connected. Um, and we'll take that reading. We will set the output pin back to the state it was in before we started. And then we will return the result we got. Um, and that result will be used back up here. Um, to decide what the from jug and the to jug are that we'll then use for our later transfer. Um, and that is it. So that's my version of the decanting problem, which I think would make a great escape room puzzle. It is essentially a mathematical problem, and if they want to, players could approach it as such, you know, carefully working out the sequence of steps they have to make. And for this particular configuration, I think it's solvable in about five moves from the initial state. Um, but it's not impossible that they could just brute force it instead. It would probably take longer, but it means that players shouldn't be frustrated for too long if they can't work it out. And obviously there is that option for the Games Master to solve the puzzle remotely or provide a hint as to the next uh, move they'd have to make as well. Um, and I like the fact that it combines that uh, mental deduction with the physicality of, of moving the connector between the containers as well. So I think it's a, a nice balance of, of different skills involved in this puzzle. And as I mentioned earlier, it's possible to theme to many different settings as well, so that this uh, indication of whatever substance it is you're transferring between the containers can be used in many, many different settings as well. As always, I will um, upload the code which I'm running on the Arduino and also the wiring diagram and the list of parts I'm using. I will put those over on my Patreon page and I will provide a link in the description at the bottom to that as well. Um, I'm only able to make these videos with the support of my amazing Patreon supporters. So I want to say thank you all very much indeed. Um, I have got, I think, about 50 projects now which I've done on this channel and I've put the resources for all of them on my Patreon account. So if you're interested in building these and finding out more about uh, how you can build these yourself in your escape rooms, do please head over and check them out. If you are unable to support me over there, don't worry about it, I totally understand. Um, I will continue to put these videos um, on uh, YouTube anyway, so you can follow along um, just with the videos here as well. Um, that's fine. Um, if you do end up making uh, a puzzle based on this in your escape room game, I would love to hear about it or to see photos of what you make as well. I'm sure you can make it look a lot better than I have done here. Um, and I really, really love hearing from people who, who make things based on these tutorials. That's um, fantastic for me to, to see that. Um, or if you have any comments or questions or suggestions, do please let me know as well and I will do my best to answer them and get back to you. Um, finally, I just hope that you found this uh, interesting or learnt something from watching this video as well. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers. Bye.